talk to you all. Uh, and it's a real pleasure seeing how this uh, partnership has matured over the years. It's still here. That's a very important uh, indicator. So I think it's uh, almost maybe five years, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Uh, so that's, you know, when you look at uh, these kind of organizations, they oftentimes come and go. Uh, but we have some folks here who are, you know, have some real uh, enthusiasm, some real believers, uh, in fact. And, and in fact, I'm often accused of being a preacher, you know, because I get up here and I uh, sort of have a soapbox. And uh, so since people call me a preacher, we're just going to start out with a good word here. We're going to start out with some scripture. So if you all would please turn to 5th Barry, chapter 22, verse 16, then this is what we read. So Wendell Berry is certainly one of our patron saints. This quote caught my eye because it talks about the soil. I am a soil scientist by training. I've drifted a little bit away from that, but that is uh, my original training. And so but when he talks about the soil here, you could, you could say the prairie, you could say the forest, you could say any natural area. But this, this idea is really what governs uh, the kind of things that I do and, and is what motivates me. The soil of any one place makes its own peculiar and inevitable sense. It is impossible to contemplate the life of the soil or the prairie for very long without seeing it as analogous to the life of the spirit. So yes, I am a hardcore scientist. I do numbers. I do all those kind of things. But in the end, it's this what motivates me. These are special places. Nay, they are sacred places. Okay? So this is the life of the spirit. It's the life of our spirit. Our spirit is connected to the spirit of the land. So, yeah, that sounds pretty preachy, but hey, people have been calling me a preacher so long. Okay, there you go. So that's one of his first books. Not his first books, but that, yeah, that could be first or second variant. There was a lot more that followed after that. So what I want to do today for you is sort of give you a whirlwind tour of the Gulf Coast from my perspective, uh, which I have called geoecology, because I'm an earth scientist. I'm a soil scientist by training. As you heard, I'm a registered professional geoscientist uh, here with the state of Texas. So that's how I tend to look at things. Most of you probably tend to look first at the vegetation and kind of wonder what might be underneath it. You know, I'm looking at the lay of the land to begin with, and then I'm always interested to learn about what, what kind of vegetation is sitting on top of that. So this is our, our uh, geology of Texas. I'm sorry to have cut South Texas off there a little bit. I know it's the center of the universe. And, Real bad that I did that. I've been thinking about that. <laughs> uh, the big, the big outstanding feature in Texas is the Balcones Escarpment. Everything Gulfward of the Balcones Escarpment is the same story. It's an infilling of a great embayment, the Gulf of Mexico. So over millions of years, we've just been filling it in, filling it in. Uh, and all of this infilling here, I'm not going to go right back to the start, because you might remember last year, remember the speaker we had that went back to the Big Bang. I'm not going that far. I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go back up here to the Rocky Mountains. Because everything we're sitting on today was at one time in the Rocky Mountains. Unbelievable, isn't it? See? So you didn't know that we actually have the Rocky Mountains, right? This is special land. It is beautiful land. Uh, so, you know, you get mountains, and uh, what happens at the mountains, especially up here, we just got erosion, you know, it gets pushed up and it keeps getting eroded, and it rolls down, it rolls down into these valleys, and it just comes on and keeps on coming. And uh, so we end up, you know, even across, even across this area here, you know, the Ogallala, all of this kind of stuff, it's all been flowing uh, this way. Now, the problem, of course, is that you know, the farther it rolls, the flatter it gets. So even though, yes, this has its origin in the Rocky Mountains, you know, some people would say it loses a little bit of its charm <laughs> as it gets down here. But I hope to tell you that what we have here along this, this part of the Gulf Coast is what I'm going to be talking about, the flat part, is as interesting and unique in its way as this stuff up here. Now, you probably wonder what kind of crack I'm smoking. <laughs> and I can't tell you, but, but it's true that what we have is a world-class special landscape. And number one, it's our landscape, okay? We're not living up here. 
I know a lot of you can probably travel because we want to go see that stuff, but this is our land. And we need to learn, as what Barry was talking about, the song of this land. So we need to know a little bit about how this land is put together, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So as I said, the number one story here is stuff's been rolling downhill, and then on top of that, the story is the sea has been going down, and it's been going up, and so we've had these cycles. All right, and this is this is from uh, some uh, Fisk and Bernard and LeBlanc. These are Gulf, Gulf Coast geologists and the early folks who put a lot of this framework together. Uh, this is the glacial uh, cycle. So when the glaciers get big, when the glaciers, you know, glaciers used to come down all the way into Kansas, uh, then the sea level drops. And so we've had this cycle up and down, a cycle of deposition and valley cutting over millions of years. But we are going to concern ourselves just with this last little bit where humans have been on the uh, ground. So this is the upper Gulf Coast of where I live. And a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about will be centered more on the upper Gulf Coast. But I'm going to try to pay homage to this wonderful South Texas coast as well. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, graphic that was developed in about 1935. And it's interesting because at that time there were no satellites. Nobody was getting up that high above the Earth, but this guy had the imagination uh, to be able to do that. His name was Deering. And so these are, this uh, again is kind of the story. So here's the last two uh, great uh, cycles here of deposition. The Lissy Formation, which we do have some here, and the Beaumont Formation. So these are what we would call the Ice Age Formations, the Pleistocene formations. And then we have a cut into these, the great rivers coming down and crossing uh, the Gulf Coast that have incised into these, uh, these formations here. And so this was the last great uh, incision that occurred. So 18,000 years ago, that was the maximum of glaciation in North America. And the sea level was 200 feet below where it is today. And the shoreline was about 200 miles beyond where it is right now. So these rivers were cutting deep valleys on their way, way, way far away. Uh, here's, uh, this is, a, this is a, a picture from the shuttle uh, some years ago. This is the Brazos, Colorado, Colorado Delta Plain right here, uh, just to give you a sense there. So sea level rise, let's see, what was I going to show here? Okay, well this is a, this is again, this is the sea level rise of just the last the last cycle, the one that we're interested in, uh, the last 18,000 years, which is just a little blip on the geologic scale, but a long time for us. So we've had basically a time period of very steep sea level rise and then leveling off within the last three, 4,000 years. Uh, Brandt here asked about uh, climate change, which I know might stir some feelings in some folks, I'm sure. But the data is suggesting, you know, here are the last four or 5,000 years that we've been comfortable here, sea level rise has been quite slow. We are now starting to approach some of these rates uh, back during the uh, time of the last melting of the ice age. So uh, this is some work from John Anderson. I'm just going to pass that up. This is also John. John Anderson is one of our preeminent geoscientists based at the Rice University. He's done a lot of work on the uh, offshore environment here. So here's the sea, here's the, uh, here's the uh, shoreline. Uh, I'm going to say, two, uh, you know, looks like uh, 18,000 years or so ago. And what they've actually been able to trace, they've been able to trace, so for example, here's Galveston uh, Bay here. So you've got the Trinity River coming down here, the Colorado, Colorado and the Trinity met offshore, and then even the Sabine met up with those and, and formed a larger uh, delta offshore. So this is very, quite recent work uh, just within the last uh, few years. Uh, but that's just to show you that those processes have continued in terms of this, these cycles. Now, so within the last 18,000 years then, the, the, the valleys have been cut to their deepest and then as sea level rose, it drowned those river valleys. And so all of our coastal marshes, you know, the Spartina alternaflora marshes in particular, the smooth cord grass, are the result of rising sea level on these floodplains and on these incised valleys, filling into those areas, and then those became the, the vast salt marshes that we have today. 
Now, uh, a little bit of the problem here is that, this I actually have this slide up for another purpose, but, uh, so we have all these great marshes. The problem is when these valleys were cut in, they inside, they have these incised valley walls. So the problem we're having now with accelerated sea level rise, as you might imagine, when sea level rise comes up here and you get all these wetlands, well, then as sea level rises some more, it's going to drown these wetlands. And so as it pushes up against this notch, we're going to lose a lot of wetlands. And that's what we're finding out right now. In fact, we've already faced that in Houston, where we had accelerated subsidence due to human extraction of groundwater. It's the same kind of thing happening. So in Houston, for example, we're going to lose this just within the next one or two feet of sea level rise. We'll probably lose most of our uh, coastal marshes. Now, once we get 15 feet of sea level rise, we'll be okay again, because then we'll rise up here, and then we'll flood all that area. But that might not happen for 100 years or so. And then, of course, there's some other issues associated with it. Okay, so now what I want to do is sort of give you the armature, the framework of the Gulf Coast, how it is put together. Because again, to sing this song of the land, we've got to know the verses. So this is verse one. You know, I'm going to give you verse one, two, and three, maybe. The vegetation, that's the final verse that you all are going to sing later on, because I don't know nothing about that. So, what we, as I told you then, all of the land that we are on, the whole Gulf Coast, without exception, is fluvial. Okay, that means it was all laid down. It's a little minor exception, but I'll, very important. <coughs> but pretty much everything, even here where we are, there were rivers that flowed right here, and they deposited stuff on here. So rivers have a certain framework. We'll just review those very quickly. You basically have two kinds of zones. You've got a meander ridge where the river flows. It builds up a levee on its side. The sandy stuff comes off first, so it tends to be a little bit elevated. And then you've got what we call the back swans. This is where the clay stuff is here. So first of all, let's look at the, let's just look at these meander belt ridges because we have these up and down the Texas Gulf Coast. And uh, meander ridges have these kinds of uh, features that you all are familiar with. It's a very dynamic environment. You've got oxbow lakes, you've got meander scrolls, you know, it's stuff is coming and going. This is actually from the Trinity River way up in Fort Worth, but it, it tells the picture I'm wanting to tell about is that you've basically got a very active landscape where you've got where the river has been going back and forth. And sometimes the river will just jump channel all together. We call that an, an avulsion. And that is actually what happened in geologic time here. So this is a map, this is a geologic map of the Houston regions. Here's Galveston Bay, the San Jacinto, the Trinity River here. And this is the Beaumont Formation. And uh, I think you can kind of make out these little uh, lighter areas here. So those are the ancient courses of the Ice Age rivers. And in this case, this is the Brazos River. Here's the Brazos River channel. Uh, floodplain today, but during the Ice Age it was flopping around all over the place. And it would and so it would it would it would cut back and forth with the oxbows, but at times when that channel just got too unstable, the whole thing would just plop over and move. Just like Caney Creek and um, I forget the other one in uh, in uh, Sugarland. I always get Oyster Creek, thank you very much. So those are those are those are those are cutoffs. That's where the channel got unstable. So in Oyster uh, Oyster Creek was the Brazos River, and it said, no, "I don't like this anymore," and the whole thing changed course. So that was what would happen here over about the let's say hundred thousand years that the uh, Beaumont surface uh, was active. And here's a little bit uh, closer image. Uh, this is from the. Uh, Bureau of Economic Geology in Houston. This is their environmental geology atlas. Uh, here is Clear Lake, which is, uh, and this is this is uh, Galveston Bay right here. So this is this is an ice age surface. This is a Pleistocene surface. It's not a floodplain today. And here is an ancient meander ridge of the Brazos River, flowing along right here, just south of Clear Creek. And you can see these ancient meander scars here that were laid down a long time ago. In fact, this area, before it was developed, was actually, they, people called it Magnolia Creek, even though it wasn't a creek that flowed all along its lane. So if we're gonna look right here at this little guy right here, this is Highway 146, for those of you that know, and uh, so Leak City is mainly right in here. So here's this ancient meander star right there. 
And there it is on the Google Earth map. So there's 146 and 96, I think, is this highway here. And here is this ancient meander truck. So that today is a wetland, right? The prairie pothole. And we can use that term, by the way. Uh, is there anybody here that has problems calling these things prairie potholes? Good. Don't even tell me because you won't really get me going. A lot of my colleagues say that we can only call these, the only wetlands that can be called prairie potholes are up in the glaciated regions of North Dakota. Well, those folks that settled that area, their cousins settled this area. And they call them potholes down here, too. So we're going to call them potholes. We're going to call them coastal potholes instead of prairie, you know, glacial potholes, if you want. So these are our wetlands. And then all of you, of course, that have been out on the prairie recognize all these little dots here, right? Who can tell me what those are? Oh, please. Pipple mounds. Yes, thank you very much. So all of you should know about your pipple mounds and your potholes. This is this pristine landscape. So when you see these old channel scars, and when you see those pimple mounds, there's one thing you can absolutely know for sure. This area has never, ever been plowed. It has never, ever been landlocked. Okay? So that makes it very unique right there. All right, so again, that's, this is then the, the meander scars. And we can see these meander scars all up and down the coast, even in this area right here. And I'll show you some pictures of that. OK, so there's that. Uh, here is a, another similar landscape. This is out by Rosenberg. Very complex. Look at all this. Uh, you know, here's the pothole. Here's a deeper pothole. Here's kind of an inner mound flat. Here's all these little uh, pimple mounds. So the way I like to put it as, you know, this is a, it's an extremely complex landscape. Again, it's not the big Rocky Mountains, okay? You really have to be here locally to get into this, right? And I don't know, you may have to smoke certain things. I'm not sure. But, uh, the point is here that this landscape is unique. Number one, the rivers flow. They sliced and diced the landscape. Okay? Second, the wind blew. Okay? It blew stuff around. We've got these pimple mounds that most folks think are, are a doodle type of thing. The mastodons roamed and they plopped around. And the buffalo wallowed. All of these kind of things making this very interesting chance melody that just cannot be replicated. And it changes as you go up and down the coast. But everywhere you go, you know, the, the, you have these, these remnants. Now, you don't see the big, long, kind of sinuous channel here that you saw on the Beaumont Formation. It's there, but it's just, again, the wind is blowing, the buffalo are wallowing, and it just makes it an interesting place. And there's what our prairie pothole landscape looks like on the upper Gulf Coast. And I was glad to see that Dr. Bryan included Houston in the, you know, unique area here at the center of the universe for all that is good and wonderful in North America. Uh, a little bit more rainfall, we're actually pushing 50 inches right here. But here's, a, here's an ancient scar, uh, a prairie pothole on the land. Here's the pimple mounds here, they, you know, a whole bunch of them out here, and then about gallery forest in the background. Uh, this is another area. Uh, this is out closer to uh, the uh, Frazzles Bend State Park. Uh, ancient meander scar here, right off of, uh, taking this off of Google Earth. So sometimes, you know, you can see these uh, channels very, very clearly. But again, this is, this is not the floodplain today. This is above the floodplain. This is at least 30,000 years old, this surface. Uh, and and it's a, it, it really is a complex uh, landscape. We have some folks down from the conservation fund uh, doing some work. And they just took this off of uh, uh, what we call the digital elevation models. This is actually in the vicinity of the Nash Prairie. And you remember last year, those of you that were on the uh, tour last year, that were you know, part of the conference last year, we had a tour out to the Nash Prairie. Uh, here, the uh, concave areas are uh, reddish or purple, and then the convex areas are green. And it's, it's just an amazing graphic here because it shows you just how much complexity. And the important thing, say, from an ecological point of view, from a biotic point of view, is that you have a template that has extreme variability at a very short range, okay? So you, you move two feet, and you go from a convex area to a concave area. And these convex areas will have a whole different veg vegetative suite than the concave areas. So the concave areas might be holding water for two, three, even six months out of the year, whereas the convex areas will be semi-arid, and they'll have a whole different vegetative suite. 
So think about that in terms of an ecological template for biodiversity. It is unequal. It is world class. It really is. Yeah, it's not the Garden of the Gods. It's not Estes Park. Granted, but it is special. And we need to learn about it. We need to know. You know, you all need to know what a pimple mound is. You need to know what a prairie bottle is. You need to know how it was formed. That's the song we're singing. Now these occur here too. So this is this is your area for those of you who are, that are here. Everybody should recognize this, right? Here's your your town. Or your, well, maybe not your town, but your metropolis, so to speak. That's Corpus Christi. And here we are on the Beaumont surface. Uh, this is all the clay stuff, the back swamp stuff, that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But you can see these kind of areas right here. Those are ancient meander ridges. Now, they're not quite as big as the ones that we see in uh, the Houston area. But again, this was formed in the same fashion. Uh, these guys, the rivers were flowing and depositing. Of course, this is all been land level, so it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, this is off the uh, geologic map of Texas. And for the Beaumont Formation, they do map the clay regions versus these interdistributaries. Well, you can call them either distributaries or interdistributaries that were flowing in this area. So I've actually pasted this right over the same area. You can get these geologic maps now for, the, for uh, Google Earth, the KMC files. It is so wonderful. I haven't even had to touch ArcGIS for a long time. And believe me, that's good because there's no way I can keep up with all that goes on in ArcGIS. But I can plop down a KMZ file and I can make some pretty cool pictures there. Uh, there's a little bit closer up. So this is, for those of us that were on the King Ranch tour yesterday, I don't think this is King Ranch itself. It might be just a little bit south of here. They're La Relis, uh division. But again, here's this ancient uh, Meander Ridge coming down here. And in fact, you can see the soil, soils. By soils, by the way, you can get KMC files, make wonderful maps on your Google Earth as well. But you can see they are mapped quite a bit differently than these old back swamp areas. And quite a lot more diversity in here. Now, it's been plowed, it's been land leveled, so all you can really see are the wisps of the old meander ridges here. Uh, I wanted to point this out. Dr. Bryant kind of mentioned this too. This is a, an older graphic, but it tells the story of our coast and the kind of changes uh, that we have. This is not uh, rainfall per se, but it is net precipitation. So it's precipitation minus evapotranspiration. So we're always getting some evapotranspiration. But what this tells you is that we go from an area of net precipitation, 12 inches over in Beaumont, to an area of net evapotranspiration, you know, 36 inches over here. I think you kept, uh, Dr. Bryant kept referring to Sapata County out over here. Very dry. So on average, a lot more going back up than is coming back down. Now that doesn't mean you don't get wetlands here because when you do get those spring rains, which doesn't happen too often, I understand anymore, then you get enough to fill up uh, some of those uh, wetlands there. Uh, so that alone makes some of these changes, you know, as we, we, the, the, the geologic armature is the same all the way up and down, but how it has evolved since then is different in large part because of a different uh, climate. So now I want to just uh, touch on the back swamps because that's the rest of our area here. In fact, in some areas, you could, as we saw here in Corpus Christi, these geologic back swamps are way more extensive than the uh, meander ridges. Whereas close to Houston, there are places where the meander ridges occupy more ground, or occupy more ground than the uh, back swamps. So again, this is the farther away you get from the river, the finer the stuff uh, rolls off of it. So we get clayier stuff out here. And we get a very unique kind of soil uh, in these areas. Uh, we call, in uh, terms of soil science, we call it a vertisol. And that word actually comes from vertigo, right, vertic. And in fact, if you were able to stand on top of the soil right up here, and you didn't move for about 10 years, you'd get vertigo. Because this soil moves, so you would actually be able to, if you could just stand there, you would feel the, you would feel the earth move beneath your feet. Uh, because what's happening here, this is a particular kind of clay known as montmorillonite or smectite, if you like. And it uh, has the unique characteristic that uh, when it gets wet, it expands out like an accordion. And when it gets dry, it shrinks 
and we oftentimes have very large cracks that uh, people can fall in and get lost if they're not careful. And so what happens with this soil is, see how the red subsoil is pushed up over here? That's actually a plastic extrusion process that is going on here. It's, the way it resolves these pressures is, it pushes up here, and so we call this a, this a little micro high, and this is a micro low, so that's how this landscape resolves itself over time, and we call this landscape a Gilgai landscape. Have y'all, who, who here has heard of the Gilgais? Not talking about the Nilgais, which are roaming around here on the prairie just south of us, but this is the Gilgai. So here's, so here's what a Gilgai looks like. So this is an undisturbed clayey prairie. Now the undisturbed clayey prairies are few and far between. Because those guys who labeled, who called those uh, depressions, they called them potholes. The clayey areas, they called those good dirt. And they liked that, and they farmed those. And they had farmed those preferentially because, you know, they're quite rich, very rich soils. So it's hard to find these things. This is out on Highway 87, uh, just uh, outside of Port Lavaca. And it's very difficult to get a picture like this. Okay, so these are the micro, low, micro highs and the micro lows in between. Because you have to, you know, normally, I mean, if this was all up in, in grass, then uh, you wouldn't be, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to see anything there. And on top of that, you've got to get it when it's a little bit moist, and these things really uh, stand out. So again, this is a, it's a different kind of complexity. Uh, these aren't, those, you know, the, it's not big, the big potholes like we get on the meander ridges, uh, but we do have the little micro lows and micro highs. And frequently you will get a different uh, vegetative suite on these micro highs as you do the micro versus the micro lows. In fact, sometimes these micro lows will actually have hydrophytic vegetation, and they'll have redox features in those micro lows and classify as a wetland, but the micro highs do not. So that gives people like the Corps of Engineers who like to see the world in black and white, how do we regulate things, then they get this just causes them all kinds of grief. And these things vary quite a bit. You can have uh, very deep micro lows or micro highs, and, and in the soil survey, we actually quantify these in terms of wavelength. So what's the wavelength? You know, the average wavelength, the micro high and micro low, what's the amplitude? You know, how deep is the micro high versus the micro low? Uh, and so these are quantified at the coast. Here's one uh, near Snook. Uh, anyone who went to Texas A&M here, the big Texas A&M? then you know about the Snook Bakery, right? Because everybody there knows about the Snook Bakery, best collages in the world. And so this is just right outside there. Again, you gotta get this the right photo. Uh, you know, nice rain, the grass is mowed down, it shows up. So fascinating landscapes, but very difficult to find uh, remnants of these. Uh, David Rosen is, I think, found a few in the Houston area. Spartina pectinata, I don't even remember what the, common name that is, uh, but a unique, rare grass, he says, and uh, I don't know if it's quite endemic to the clayey prairies, but that's where it's found, on these undisturbed kind of areas. Uh, these are, you probably can't even see that one very well, but that's, that's a yield guy there. There's uh, up close, so yeah, see that all? Oh, 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 I hit the bad one. Oh, it comes back, good. Okay, here we go. So see, here's the highway. See all the little dark and light spots? Gilgai. And it even occurs right here in Corpus Christi. Well, this is Kingsville, okay, but close enough, right? Right here on the coastal bend. I took this picture flying in to Corpus Christi Airport. I looked out my window and said, hey, what is that? Well, that is not Gilgai anymore because it's been planed and landlocked, right? But these Gilgai, remember we were talking about a plastic extrusion process. So the subsoils here, not too far deep, have a lot of caliche in them, naturally soil-forming caliche. And so in those, in those micro highs, you will have the caliche at a much shallower depth than you do in the micro lows, because you know, there's the sort of a positive feedback where the micro lows, then more water is leaching, and of course you're pushing this up. So when they plow this baby, and they land level it a little bit, uh, or even if they don't land level, these little micro highs have more calcium carbonate in them. Calcium carbonate ties up stuff like phosphorus. So whatever's growing here, this is chlorotic 
where these micro highs are, and it's growing fine over there. And this was a big Victoria clay area. So, hey, isn't that cool? Yeah. Now, a lot of people get confused between Gilgai and the Prairie Potholes. But you all weren't confused, right? Because you didn't even know what a Gilgai was. <laughs> but now you know what a Gilgai and a Prairie Pothole. Now you can join the ranks of the confused. Because now you know enough. So you didn't even know enough to be confused. But, but hopefully you can get beyond the confusion. So this is uh, Johnson Space Center. Anybody uh, who's looked at aerial photos of the Johnson Space Center, there's this big arrow out there pointing to this thing. I don't know why they have the arrow, and I don't know what that thing is. But you can, you can, you can see, it's like if you want to see Gildai on a photo, on a map, you can see it right there. And this is a, a map of, uh, that we did for uh, our local college, Houston Galveston Area Council. We just took the soil survey and uh, where these high shrink swell soils. So red is crack your foundation tomorrow, and yellow is crack it next week, and green is, well, it might take a little while. So you know that, uh, you know, foundation repair companies make a lot of money, right? You've seen them. I don't know if you see that down here, but all of our celebrities in Houston, right? Nolan Ryan, he's on the TV talking about Atlas Foundation, right? <laughs> fix it once, whatever. So same in Dallas as well. They're a big uh, 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 Vertisols too. Uh, and actually, I don't think I put this slide in here, but you may not realize it, but Vertisols are what gave the settlement pattern of Texas its pattern. If you think about all of our big cities, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, and then on the Gulf Coast, Houston down to Corpus, all of these cities were founded in areas of Blackland Prairie, right? The Blackland Prairie, the central Blackland Prairie that comes down, and then we got the coastal Blackland Prairie here. So I would say if you took that swath of population, you're talking at least 70, 80 percent of Texas. So dirt is what made us who we are. Don't forget that. And there, okay, so there, there, there you go. There's the, there, here's the big swaths on a statewide basis. The Blackland Prairie there, uh, and then down here. And then of course you've got all kinds of little, like, around, even around Holly Station, you have some Blackland Prairies in there. All right, so we're going to come down the coast a little bit here. I'm using my geologic map of Texas. That's my Google Earth my trusty tool here. And just to point out a few areas, certainly you know about the Barrier Islands. I didn't really want to spend too much time on that. Uh, a different kind of geology, dune swells uh, here in between, and then the dunes, a very interesting hydrology. I'll talk a little bit more about that in <coughs> our area here. So we have this current, let's see, where we go. That's the current uh, barrier Island. That's a barrier island today. That barrier island, again, based on the work of John Anderson, is at most about 4,000 years old. And it is going to be breached, just as there were barrier islands in the past that were breached by sea level rise. It will be breached by the new episode of rising sea levels. But we have an interesting area of older, of older barrier islands right over here. So some of you might be familiar with that. We call this the Ingleside Sand. So this is a barrier island from one of those past episodes, right? Remember, we were talking about the glaciers going up and down. So this would be the cycle past. And uh, here in this area, there's a, this is a Live Oak Peninsula, that's Lamar Peninsula, Blackjack, I think we call that, right? Uh, Atlantis National Wildlife Refuge. And even we have a nice little piece that runs right up here, Smith Point. Just some beautiful wetlands and prairie problems. But a little bit different because it's an older landscape. It's been there a longer time. And so, for example, this is the Powderhorn Ranch, uh, just uh, south of Port Lavaca, which is over here. So again, we've got all these potholes. This is a totally, it's a very sandy uh, surface. The sand probably goes down, I think, a good six feet easily. Uh, but <clears throat> pocked with all these wonderful little potholes. And of course, this area is now slated to become wonderful little ranchettes. Isn't that nice? Probably bought by environmentalists who want to have a big yard, right? And they feel that they're doing the right thing by having a big lawn. Or, you know. So yeah, that's good that they can feel that way as they destroy the uh, 
wonderful 100,000 year old potholes. So this is, the, this is the framework up and down the coast. Remember as I said, this is all fluvial. Here's these great rivers coming down that are mainly forested. So I'm not going to talk about those because you guys aren't interested in the forest, you just want to bear it. So, and besides that, I don't have time to be talking about it. Uh, so here this again is the Lissy Formation, the Beaumont. The difference with the Lissy Formation, which is important to many of you because that is the uh, Katy Prairie, which is basically, Katy Prairie would go, is basically everything east of the Brazos on the Lissy Formation as long as it's prairie. Then it runs into forest over here, so we don't call it the Katy Prairie anymore. Then it's the Katy Forest. Maybe. Actually, we don't have a name for that. Uh, but but then you can't. The difference between the Katy and the Lissy, the, uh, the Lissy and the Beaumont, is that because this is over 100,000 years old, you can't see these little distributary channels anymore. The potholes there tend to look a lot more like what's on the Ingleside sands, which is kind of more circular type things. So this is the same story all the way up and down the coast, but we get a little blip right in here. We get a little change to the story here. It's still, this stuff is still, it's underneath this over here, but this is a little thing plastered on top of here because we have some very important things going on the Gulf Coast. You all know what longshore drift is, right? You remember that from your geology class. The sand is moving down the coast this way and then it's moving up this way. And then there's a place where they collide. They collide right here. This is called